Hi, this is Ken Della, Bastide City Reporter for the Herald Bulletin. I'm with Representative Susan Brooks. Hi, Welcome Ken. Welcome to uh, the Herald Bulletin, Susan. Good to be here. It's good to be here on a day when it's almost 70 degrees in Indiana. It is beautiful outside. I'm waiting for the flowers to start coming up, and you know, it's, it's great to be home. It's great to be home this week. I bet. Well, I'm excited because the month of May is right around the corner. And <laughs> The 100th running of the Indy 500. Looking forward to it. I plan on being there. Good for you. And Good. maybe taking in some of the concerts ahead of time and, you know, getting out there for the weekend. It's it's always so much fun. Kids come home. Uh, you know, it's a big family event. Great. A lot of fun. Yeah, it's going to be a great, great race this year. Of course, we're not here to talk about racing. We're here to talk about what's happening in Washington. And today you mentioned at the Rotary Club uh, how crucial it is in this country and in, in the state of Indiana that we get a handle on heroin addiction and the use of heroin. And I thought you made an interesting point when you said 80% of that addiction starts with prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. What can Congress do to kind of tackle this problem? Or is well, it a state problem? It's, it's not a state problem. It's not a Madison County, Anderson, or state of Indiana problem. It's a national epidemic. Right now, more people are dying of overdose deaths from drugs than car accidents in the country. We have a couple of people dying every 45 minutes in the country. And we know that uh, opioid or prescription drug abuse is often where it starts. About 80% mm -hmm. of those who um, are on heroin started with prescription drugs. So um, there have been a lot of bills filed in Congress. A lot of members across the country are very engaged in it. I have a bill to try to create a federal task force of the federal agencies involved in prescribing, like uh, Health and Human Services, like the VA, like um, DEA, to come up with the best practices for prescribers across the country. Because we know that if we can get the prescribers, doctors, nurse practitioners, dentists, podiatrists, really engaged in helping focus on that addiction problem, right. that will actually hopefully help stem the tide of the heroin epidemic. Now, I noticed some legislation that would uh, limit the number of pills that a person can get at any one time. That, you know, you might be able to get 10 or 20 and then have to go back. And would that help you think by limiting the number of pills at any one time? You know, I actually think that that's what we need the prescribers and the professionals, um, healthcare professionals, to tell us. And I think a lot of cases are very different. We do know that people have chronic pain. Right. We also know that people who are suffering from um, horrible effects of cancer have significant pain. So we don't want to um, have a one size fits all yeah. for everyone with the issue of opioids. We know that we need to make sure that those who absolutely need their pain meds get them but I think what's happened over the last couple of decades is that uh, people have been over prescribing okay. and people have been demanding and have gotten addicted right. to their prescription drugs um, and then once they get off or once the doctors start getting them uh, restricting their prescriptions uh, if they truly have an addiction, oftentimes they're going to heroin uh, because it's easier to get, it's easy to get on the streets, right. it's pretty cheap, um, but it has such deadly consequences. Horrible, horrible addictions, and far too many people are overdosing. I think one of the points you made today at Rotary was the impact of somebody who's addicted on their family. Yes. It extends to not just family, but uh, you mentioned children that all of a sudden CASA workers are having to go and, and Child Protective Service and tell them that their parents have died from an overdose. That's got to be devastating. I had a, a great roundtable discussion yesterday with um, uh, Department of uh, Children's Services, DCS mm -hmm. workers from around the district, as well as juvenile probation. Your chief juvenile probation officer, Mike Gray, was there um, with judges in juvenile courts. We sat and talked about the phenomenon they're seeing. And even though the governor, Governor Pence, has increased the number of child case workers and child uh, in the you know, child welfare system, we can't keep up. Up. The cases keep coming, and um, they're very complex problems when the parents parents are addicted uh, to drugs. Um, and so we have. And what's also so incredibly sad is it can be very generational. 
They're even finding now that some grandparents are addicted to heroin or prescription drugs. So even if a child is removed from a home uh, when first responders or the ER is dealing with an overdose and they call child services because you know their parents have OD'd, yeah. um, there's some concern about which relatives uh, which relatives are safe enough for a child to be placed in that home. So the system is being really overwhelmed. Um, and so we, we absolutely need a lot more treatment for young people and for adults. Um, we, need to, we need to have more um, people volunteering as guardians at litem or yeah. CASAs in the courts. Um, we need to, we often, the criminal justice system in many ways ends up rescuing these people um, when they do arrest them, um, when they are involved in the drug trade, and um, sometimes that actually can save them. Sometimes intervention in the child welfare system or the criminal justice system, and I know uh, visiting with Judge Hopper today, you're doing some really good things with drug treatment issues, yeah. uh, trying to get people on Vivitrol, uh, which can actually stop that addiction. Yeah. This addiction is a disease. It's not something we're gonna arrest our way out of. We've got to work on this from a very holistic approach. Well, we all know that Congress doesn't move very quickly. It doesn't, that's true. Uh, but I mean, this is a it's problem. frustrating. Yeah, it's a problem that's nationwide. It is. Are you optimistic that maybe something could get done in this very political year before the end of the year? I am because both sides of the aisle have come together on heroin. There is a bill moving in the Senate. We're waiting to see if it comes out of the Senate. But I know that the leadership in the House is talking about a number of different bills that have been filed to um, talk about this as a national problem, you know, from Maine and New Hampshire uh, to California and Indiana's, you know, in the middle of it. Um, but we do have some of the higher rates of, uh, of opioid and heroin related uh, arrests and overdoses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had the issue down in Scott County yeah. of uh, the HIV epicenter for the world, not yeah. just the country. And that was because so many people in Scott County were addicted to drugs, that they shared the needles right. and, you know, then, um, you know, passed HIV, uh, Hep C, and the other types of diseases. So it's a public health emergency. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Was, yeah. I want to change the subject a little bit mm -hmm. and ask you about the presidential race. Okay. Okay, because. Interesting, isn't it? Is, it? Yeah, it it's is very interesting. interesting what's going on. Yes. Of course, you endorsed uh, Chris Christie. I did. Who is now out of the race. Yes. And has endorsed Donald Trump. Right. And I was just wondering, did, did your endorsement flow with that, or have you changed and decided to endorse somebody else? No, good question. Chris Christie, Governor Christie, and I have been friends because we were U.S. attorneys right. together in the Bush administration. We got to know each other in late 2001, and I served as U.S. attorney till 07. So I worked with him as a U.S. attorney, and then was very proud when he became governor of New Jersey, and have really admired uh, many of the ways in which he's governed in New Jersey. So um, when you have have a friend running for president of the United States, it was a very easy endorsement for me to sure. jump onto the, and I was disappointed, quite frankly, because I do think he does have the kind of leadership and the kind of governing background that the country needs. Um, so when he dropped out of the race, I thought it would be best for me to just wait, uh, let the dust settle, see what's happening, things are happening. Um, and. A lot of states are still weighing in on this. I don't think it is a foregone conclusion exactly yet who the nominee is going to be. Um, I haven't talked with the governor yet. I plan on talking with him more specifically about his endorsement. Um, actually, we're supposed to be talking sometime this week um, as to you know why he jumped in, although they had worked together. Uh, Donald Trump um, obviously has work in Atlantic City, yeah. Trump casinos, and they you know know each other from the New York, New New Jersey uh, relationship, and um, I know they have been friends for quite some time. So I'm not completely surprised that he jumped in. He he was looking for someone who'd run things. Right. Obviously, Donald Trump has run a very big Trump enterprises, yeah. and it's a very complex government to run. And so I think someone with significant management experience is what the country needs because we've seen what eight years under a president who had not run things. Right. You know, President Obama had really never run anything. And um, I think the country um, has really suffered under his leadership. And I think a lot of 
Um, a lot of folks believe that, believe the country hasn't been headed in the right direction. That's why I'm going to support the Republican candidate, a nominee who comes out of this. I think that the Democrat candidates will just continue to carry forth the president's agenda and the president's you know, many failed policies. Right. I think it would be very interesting if all of a sudden, for the first time in a long time, we have a brokered convention, and who knows what happens there. <laughs> yeah, it is, uh, and actually with Indiana's primary being in May, yeah. um, it's possible typically by the time the primary presidential comes to us, the nominee has already racked up enough delegates, yeah. but the delegate count is being split at this point, and it's unclear whether or not Donald Trump or anybody will have enough delegates by May 3rd, so our primary may actually really make a difference. And, uh, you know, we know that voters really turn out in presidential election years. Yes. But I think what's very interesting about this race so far is that they are turning out, voters are turning out in unprecedented numbers all across the country. Yes. So they're very engaged, both sides of the aisle. Uh, they're very engaged. And um, I think a, a brokered convention, something that will be something we haven't experienced for many decades, I believe. And so oh, not sure what that will be like. Yeah, it'd be fun to be there. It would, it will be. I plan on being there. Uh, the last question I have for you, and I think we got a few minutes. You mentioned today that you have a youth advisory committee. I do. Okay. Commission, is that yeah. what it is? Yeah, we call our youth advisory group. Okay, group. And uh, I thought it was interesting that they had three key points. Mm -hmm. National security was one. Social security was another. And I think jobs was the third. Was that well, somewhat, yeah, you were right on national security. So we invite young people, high school, eighth grade to seniors okay. in high school to meet with me about once a quarter, different places in the district. We invite all kids. We post it on social media primarily. Yeah. We usually get between 40 and 50 kids who will come to usually a library on a Saturday morning. Um, when we first sat down with them, and we've had, I believe, four now, we asked them what their top priorities were, let them vote on them, have discussions discussions about them. Sure. National security, top priority. The debt. That was it. The, the debt. debt of 19 now, 19 trillion. Yeah. Veterans issues was were something they very much cared about, wanted to learn more about. Jobs in the economy certainly are there, but uh, the debt, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid are part of what's driving our debt. So our next meeting with those kids, um, we've had a great meeting with the head of the FBI on national security, have had a great meeting with veterans, with some disabled veterans on veterans issues, and we're going to bring in a group to explain and educate them on the debt as well. Great. So I, I was a little surprised that veterans was on that list. So were we. We Way were surprised. pleasantly surprised. But you know, I think uh, young people see so many young people in their communities, and there has been a lot of attention, particularly with the problems at the VA. Exactly. And so the media and members of Congress and our oversight have helped expose so many of the really horrible problems in VA hospitals across the country. And so I think that has really affect them, affected them and has touched them. And and many of them may have family members who have served in Iraq exactly. or Afghanistan. And so they very much want to know more about veterans' issues, how we support veterans. And I think, uh, and many of them, it's not uncommon for a lot of these young um, men and women who are coming to these events to have family members who have served. Right. And so they have this interest in public service and interest in serving their country. So I'm thrilled that they, they cared that much to want to uh, know more about it. Yeah, it was encouraging to hear that. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming to Anderson today. Thanks. Thanks. And, uh, appreciate it. Go Red Hawks. Okay. Beat Ball State. Yeah, well, I'm man. always sorry when an Indiana team loses <laughs> in a tournament, but my alma mater of Miami, uh, they, they've they struggled in basketball over the years, so it's kind of nice to get a win. That's good to see you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.